All right, folks. Today we have uh, a guest speaker. We have two guests with us, one who will officially be a guest speaker. Uh, so this is Guy. I'll let him introduce himself. But he has some previous experience here at AUT uh, and also, I believe, at Massey University. And hopefully he will tell us about his current position. And if not, I will ask him some questions afterwards. Uh, so he's here to talk about wallets, risk, and tokens, which is, uh, we had a little chat in advance. To, today on the syllabus it says wallets and tokens, which could mean a broad variety of topics. Um, anyway, so we'll let Kai take over. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Um, hi, I'm Guy. I'm a geek. Um, yeah, as uh, Jeff mentioned, I used to um, teach here at AUT. I've uh, left here in 2013. Has anybody here taken highly secure systems? I'll make you very sad. It was my favorite paper to teach here. <laughs> uh, a lot of cryptography and stuff. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty much a, a, a geek and out of understanding I've, I've taught highly secure systems and distributed and mobile systems and algorithms and data structures and these things. And so there was this thing reoccurring on the internet, uh, blockchain, Bitcoin at that time. And I just wanted to find out more about it. And I did read about it and wanted to understand it. I was thinking, hey, this is cool. You have different things coming together. You have cryptography put to good use. You have um, distributed algorithm finding, the, the consensus finding and stuff like that coming together. And game theory, the whole thing that adjusts the twiddle knobs and that actually make magically something like that sustainable and incentivizing the right things that you, know, you could have North Korea participate, which you wouldn't usually in a business system, but what can they do? They can't make it worse. They can only make it better. And that's the right of thing that tickled my fancy. And then seeing how things add up and extrapolating where Bitcoin is. And what if you put not money or value on there, but what if you put data on there? What if you put logic on there? And that's where, anyway. So that's where I'm kind of coming from. Um, if you want to have a better chat with me, shot me a beer and um, we can chat about everything, almost everything. Um, all right, so yeah, Jeff asked me to, to come in and talk about today's topic and he gave me a bit of a potpourri of, of wild mixed topics and I tried to put them together in a way that they make sense. So wallets, from wallets I get to risk mitigation and, and then um, tokens, which is, as I've heard, a little bit foreshadowing a lot of the stuff that is to come um, going forward in, in next lectures. Oh, and what am I doing now? On the one hand, I work with this guy here with Paul, a company called Everlasting. They're trying to make Bitcoin and crypto and blockchains everlasting. So when you die, what happens if you don't have the key anymore because you can't just rock up with a piece of paper, hey, my hubby has died, my wife has died, I want access to this. And they're just gonna shrug the shoulders and laugh. <laughs> so where's the keys? No keys, no money. Um, so how can you do that? Or you're in a company, somebody goes on, on holiday, somebody is uh, falling sick, how do you have continuity? How do you have things like multiple people having to action things? If you have multiple people, it becomes even more crucial that the right people are available at all times. So that's kind of the stuff Paul will maybe, possibly, talk more about it. I will talk a little bit in my talk. I'm working for another company called uh, 21E8. That's a weird company. Um, again, if you want to know more, shout me beer. And then I'm working for a bank at the moment. So I'm a little bit between seats. I used to be CTO in a startup, I'm dealing also with blockchain tech. Their funding round didn't go so well, so now I'm doing three different contracting jobs, seeing what comes in the future, who knows. If you want to offer me a job, shout me a beer. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Uh, as I kind of don't work for a particular company that I'm championing here besides Everlasting, I just put Department of Geeks on there, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, I like salty things. I like bacon, so beer and bacon goes very well. All right, so let's get started with some general things. 
Firstly, there's a thing called entropy. Has anybody come across the term entropy anywhere before? Anyone an engineer, a chemical engineer, a chemist or something? So entropy, I'm German. So we, we Germans have words for everything. And there was this concept of energy around for a long time. And, but there's kind of this energy thing, but which is like unusable energy. And the Germans needed a term for it. And there was a German scientist who coined the term entropy, which is uh, more from, from the natural sciences, a, a degree of randomness, state of randomness. You know, when you have coffee and you pour milk into it, it mixes by itself. So every system strives towards increasing its entropy. But it doesn't unmix itself, which would be finding a degree of order. Um, I'm not talking about this, but entropy in cryptography is used as a term for randomness, for good randomness, for, for something that's truly random and not just something shuffling around that looks unorderly, but actually there's a pattern behind it or there's a mechanism behind it. And, and this is very, very important for the security of things because otherwise people who know these rules can go and uh, follow these rules and maybe come up with your private key. And what happens if your private key is uh, compromised? Your funds are gone on a blockchain. Um, talk to people who used to work for Cryptopia. They can tell you a story or two about it. Does anyone know who Cryptopia is? Show some hands. No? All right. Cryptopia is an exchange that has gone belly up. What was it in 2018 somewhere? 2018, 2019, somewhere around about there. And uh, they've had a breach of security on their system. Some people are talking, maybe it was an insider job, but they've done something very dumb. They've had their wallet keys, the private keys, sitting in the database. With somebody getting access to a database, they have all the keys. With all the keys, they can leisurely siphon off, transfer the coins, the tokens to whatever other wallets and take their time to do everything. So anyway, so in cryptography, this is about true randomness. Um, and you can have various sources of that. Um, so on the one hand, you have your PRNGs or your pseudo random number generators or your cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators, which you're using when you're generating keys, um, specific random numbers that need to be held to a very high standard. Uh, on Linux, you can get an in almost endless source out of them from dev random or dev u random. Um, and they're physical ones that work on um, instable states and things, and they uh, can be collected and recorded. Your computers are usually doing that by taking the timing, how long does it take between accesses to the disk, between different actions that are coming out from the physical world, and they're just collecting them, so when you need entropy, they can siphon them off. Uh, but you never know really whether they're very good, and that's kind of what this uh, Dilbert cartoon is trying to aim at, because, yeah, it's, it's randomness. You never know. Okay, so... If you want to create a, a wallet for a blockchain, you've talked about elliptic cryptography, I suppose. Yes, I see some nodding here and there. Come on, you need to be a little bit more energetic here. <laughs> um, uh, so you have a, a key pair, the private key, which you're protecting like your eyeball and the public key that you can pass around like your business cards. And that private key is the thing. So. A wallet is basically your private key, which gives you access to anything. And from that access, you can then uh, have stuff. And seed phrases, we'll get to that. Um, so a vanilla wallet um, is just a cryptographic key pair. More precisely, um, we're using um, elliptic curve cryptography, uh, namely ECDSA, so digital sig signature algorithm on elliptic curves. And in most cases, uh, like on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many other chains, um, this particular curve, SecP256K1. 
It is just a bunch of mathematical parameters that make this elliptic curve that is very efficient to compute, but also very secure and not creating huge massive keys like RSA or DSA would do. The thing is you must protect those private keys so that they don't get lost. Um, and they are long, bulky, unwieldy numbers. There are some examples on the bottom. So if you have a, I'll get to what BIP 39 and 32 is um, later. But you have some, some of these, uh, like some keys or some seeds and they're long and awful. If you try to write them down by hand, are you actually getting everything right? And if you have lost it, you're a little bit in a, excuse my French, in a shitty spot. So BIP39 is, a, have you heard of BIPs? Bitcoin Improvement Proposal is BIP. Um, so they have their different proposals, their different things, and they, they get a number, and when they agree on them, then they become a thing. And BIP39 is one of them that goes and allows you to encode um, different uh, secrets in terms of a bunch of words, 12 or 24 words or something like that. Um, so word is much more human me humanly meaningful and, and easier to handle in a way. Um, but in the end, this is just, an, if we go back to this one previous, so here on the seed, you see that's a hexadecimal number, so base 16. So you have four bits being represented as one character. This is probably base 32. I'm not 100% um, sure, but you have different kinds of encoding for different things that have different properties. You might have heard of base 64 encoding, which is usually used to attach, for example, images and things to emails um, where you can represent binary data just in terms of human readable normal characters, 64 characters namely. So there are different ways of encoding. So everything can be encoded. You can do binary encoding that becomes very, very long and you're losing very easily uh, track of where you are in the line and different encodings have different properties. So, um, Base 58, true, 58, yeah. And they've taken some specific characters out that are easy to, um, to confuse with each other, yes. So mnemonic encoding is just another way to encode stuff, but it's doing that um, by means of English words or just words. And um, that is, you have a word list that has 2048 words meaning you can represent every word with a number, uh, with an 11-bit number. So you're chunking everything into 11-bit slices. So if you're looking at keys uh, for 256-bit elliptic curves, they have 256-bit keys. That would make, if you divide that by 11, 23.3 words. Bit of an odd thing. You can't have a fraction of a word there. but so. The rest, so you have 24 words, the rest is um, a checksum. So every 32 um, bits, you have one bit of a checksum so that you know whether something has gone fuzzy in it. Um, so they're using the entire thing. So these word lists of 2048 words are made in a way that they're easy English words, that they're uh, not ambiguous, that they're different um, in, uh, or that the first, first four characters define the entire word already. So there won't be different words that are too similar sounding or written or complicated to write. So 2048 easy words that you can differentiate by four characters. There are word lists in 10 different languages, not in German though. There is a proposal for one, but that's been around and they couldn't agree and they're bickering too much, those Germans. So um, it hasn't found its way in anywhere. I, I would have thought, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I would have thought German would be able to talk that. No, it's not. <laughs> Has anybody heard of Diceware? So Diceware is a system when you want to generate passwords, secure passwords. You can generate true randomness, good entropy to come back to that by rolling a dice. It's got six sides. 
So dice where you're users where you're rolling five dice at a time and you put them into order that gives you a five digit number with each number being from one through six. And you can look that up in a, in a word list and that has 7,700 something words. And um, so that gives you a word. And if you do that, depending on how good you want your password to be, um, you pick, I don't know, four or five or six or whatever words, and that makes a password of passphrase that is very secure. So Diceware is another one that uses kind of this mnemonic uh, type of schema. Again, there's a Maori word list. There's not a German word list. I know the guy who's made the Maori word list in New Zealand. <laughs> Rangi Kemara has done that. Interesting bloke. Anyway, um, so by, by these words, 12 words for one key, usually you have on the seeds. I'll get to that in a minute, what that is. You have uh, more bits that you need to represent. So usually those seeds are 24 words long. Um, you can just write down the words that are coming out of it and um, just the first four characters. That's enough for typing them in. So you can have auto... Uh, completion on your computer, on your device. Um, and you can use that very good to back up your private key or your seeds or whatever. Um, if it's a seed, you need to run it through a PBKDF2. PBKDF2, it's a funky acronym. Password-based key derivation function number two. That does something like at least 2,048 rounds of um, HMAC computation. Have you come across HMAC? Uh, it's a message authentication code that is keyed um, and, and that's hashing based. So as an example, the thing we've seen before, the key and the seed, would be this. Finger, trip, serial, hover, swarm, office, and power health. Satoshi has even made his way in there together with an avocado. Um, so that's much easier to manage. Um, and then you can write those things down. I have forgotten to put a slide in there, but um, this is something called a steel wallet. They're very often used for securing those things. So your house burns down, a piece of paper would go up in flames and smoke and become ashes. A steel wallet is rather resistant. So the steel wallets are about that size, like half a postcard size. They're usually kind of sliding out. And then they have those little tracks in there and you have some stamped or etched letters that you can break out and with some tweezers you can slide them in. And each of these compartments has uh, space for four characters. So you can slide them in and with this thing, with that one and the opposite side um, of it, you can have your 24 words then numbered and you can store them in there. Uh, there's a hole in there so you could put a padlock in there, you can put that in a bank deposit vault or whatever. If an earthquake is happening, you can find that thing again. Have you heard the story of the guy in the UK who's lost a hard drive with a computer that has been dumped and where people have been plowing through the rubbish dump trying to find that, that computer with a hard drive and he's offered millions and, and, um, to people to help him find it and people have tried, they haven't been able to find it yet. So this thing, if you find it, you can always reconstruct the thing. You don't need a hard drive. In the Big Bang Theory, there was something where there was a USB key that held the wallet that got erased by Stuart because he said, oh, I'll just clean it. I'll wipe it. I can sell it again. And yeah, everything gone. And those are different things. So just ignore that those nitro keys are on there. There are also hardware wallets. Um, Paul has one here. So they're little electronic gadgets you can plug into your computer. Those are holding the private key and the private key cannot be taken out. And um, so this is what they can look like. There's a little USB port and you plug them into your computer and then they ask you to enter some kind of a pin uh, beforehand. So this is a, a wallet so you don't have to have it on your computer and when you want to make a transaction you plug them in this thing does the cryptographic signature that then is being sent out to the network to do this, the, um, the signing. So, um, and these usually also have a, a seed phrase. So if one of these breaks, you have the seed phrase on your hardware wallet, on your, on your steel wallet, 
you can get another one of them and you can reprime them and, and get back into them. How that works with the seed phrases, I'll um, show you in a minute. So these things are quite handy to have if you want to have some good resilience into things that they don't go and evaporate and, and all your millions of dollars worth in Bitcoin go um, away. Um, All right, so you can put these uh, mnemonic phrases onto these things or write them down. If you have ever installed a, um, a mobile wallet, you're probably also being prompted, please write down these things because that's how you can get your wallet back even if your phone goes and dies and you reinstall it on another phone. Just don't store it in the cloud storage system. No. <laughs> so very deceptive people store it in a file that goes into their documents folder on Windows and all of a sudden, yeah, OneDrive has eaten it. It's there. So do not ever do these kinds of things. Uh, they're always looking for it, and the U.S. intelligence agencies are actually scavenging through public cloud storage a lot. All right. Now, people often have different or uh, the need for different wallets. Maybe one is for, you know, like your... Uh, your petty cash for, for buying stamps, for, for getting the coffee every day, and one for holding your life savings and stuff like that. So um, it's become a little bit difficult if you have um, JBOX, J-B-O-K-S, uh, so just a bunch of keys. So if you have a bunch of wallets all with their individual keys that you all need to back up individually and make sure you don't lose them, and then, oh, no, I created another one. I did where did I put the piece of paper? I don't know. Um, so there are ways now that people have created to make it a whole lot easier. So they have created these um, HD wallets. And HD is for hierarchical deterministic wallets. So you have a kind of a tree-like structure where you have a path, like a file system path. Uh, and you can organize your keys in some way. Um, and create different keys for different purposes, maybe for different networks. So you have one for your, when you're developing blockchain software, maybe you have one for the Ethernet, uh, Ethereum testnet, where you're testing stuff and one key for, your, uh, for the production network. Or you have a, a Bitcoin, a Litecoin, an Ethereum, and whatever other keys. So HD wallets can manage all those keys for you and the beauty is you only need one seed. So that's the, the seed um, or seed phrase, which is then the 24 word big gun that you need to manage. Um, and as I said, you have a kind of a path. M is always the um, kind of the master or the main net. I think master is being discouraged to use uh, or the, the main key. Um, and then you have a path. So for example, this would be the third child, we're counting from zero, of the first child, but the first child, there's a prime on it, I'll talk later about it, of the hardened master or, or main key in there. So as you see, you can have, through these indexes, you can create a tree and that can fan out into, into big, big numbers very, very quickly if you need to. All you need is the one seed phrase and maybe the hardware wallet that manages it or whichever way you use to derive those. Um, so hardened keys, they act in some way as a, I would call it as an equivalent, a ripstop. So when you're sailing and you something, you get a tear in your sail, you don't want to tear off your entire sail and you're stranded in the middle of the ocean. So you often have ripstops in there. So it only tears up to a particular point. The sail becomes less flexible at the ripstop and, and less and, and heavier and whatever. But it, it's a safety net. It prevents you. It's like a safety belt. It adds weight to your car, but it secures you. In that way, um, the hardened keys are ripstops. So that uh, because if you have the path available and some public key, or public keys, you can have all the public keys available. As I said, they're like business cards. Chick, 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 chick. You can just pass them out to everybody. Um, or put them on your LinkedIn profile or something. But if you have one 
private key anywhere exposed. You have the entire tree exposed. But as soon as you have somewhere one of those hardened keys in there, one of those rip stops, that's where it stops. You only have the subtree under that hardened one um, exposed. So why don't you use hardened ones everywhere? Because they're not quite as flexible because you can derive more easily public and private keys in some way and you can use them a little bit more universally if they're non-hardened. But then you can protect some parts of that tree. I'm gonna leave it at that and not talk too much about it, but just so that you see there are different ways of doing it. So that's how you can make a whole lot of wallets with only one secret that you need to have. And, um, Oh yeah, so this is what those trees, for example, looks like. So you have at the very top your seed, then you have your master extended key, the M, which has been derived by running through that password derivation function. And from there on, you're going to fork off where you have different purposes on different networks, different accounts, and you see they have those paths that are being extended going all the way and then each one delivers you an address and a private key that you can use for that particular purpose. And uh, they have a bit of a structure which I'm going to get into in a moment. But the different parts of these derivations and they're standardized in this BIP32 and uh, what's the other one? BIP43. So here I've just shown for as, as an example the derivation from a uh, the parent private key to a uh, child private key. Um, each key, the parent key, is the K, and it has then some chain code. The chain code is some extra entropy of the same size as a key. If a key is 256 bytes, uh, bits, your chain code is 256 bits. And then you go and um, take that key and that chain code, and you run it through an HMAC function, where you use for the HMAC function, a HMAC function is like a hashing function that takes a key. So you use the, uh, the chain code of the parent as the key and the data is then the serialization of your point of the private key concatenated with some counter. And you're hashing across that, that gives you an I and that I is a 512 bit value because you have a SHA 512 HMAC function you're splitting that into um, a left and a right hand size. The child key is then, um, if you take that uh, left hand side, you pass that back into a point and add the parent key to it. You're doing some elliptic curve magic there. And that gives you the, the new child key and the child code a chain code is the right hand half of it so that you're splitting that, you're reshuffling, splitting it and doing some math on it. There's some corner case treatment, for example, if you have illegal points, you need to go once more. There's some illegal points like, you know, when you don't, you don't want to multiply by zero because that eats up everything <coughs> and having these types of um, corner cases. And here's then the differentiation, how you treat it for a normal child, for a hardened child, where you're doing some extra things so that with the concatenation and hashing, you're breaking the chain and you can't actually go backwards anymore beyond that rip stop. There are other things in there if you're interested in, and in the cryptography, look for BIP32, BIP43, you'll find it. BIP32 is the thing that describes all this. I just wanted to show you, this is in general the mechanism how it works. I hope I'm not going a little bit too far because I can totally geek out on cryptography. Just, yeah, just trying to make myself look good, no. <laughs> um, all right, and now for the multi-account wallets, that's the, the BIP44 bit. So, because you might be dealing with more than one blockchain, not just with Bitcoin, not just with Ethereum, not just with Litecoin or whatever but with a whole bunch of them. Um, so multi-account HD wallets now can handle multiple coin types, multiple network like test nets and stuff like that as well. And for that, they have standardized a little bit how they assemble that path. So it's the same thing. It's only you're putting in certain places, things in place. So the first one is the, the purpose 
then you have your coin type, your, like your Bitcoin, Ethereum, or whatever, then your account and, and some, I don't actually exactly know what these things are, but they're all specified and they give you then a host of keys that you can generate. And the ones with the prime are the hardened ones. So as you see, they have in that standard defined a number of rip stops so that if something gets compromised because you have to have some key that's sitting on some system that has to do things in an automated way and somebody hacks into that system, you don't have everything being broken. So you don't need to exchange all your keys. If you want to have a play with some of these things, uh, I suppose you're going to distribute the slides afterwards, maybe. Right, yes. So um, have a look there. It's a very interactive site from Ian Coleman. Um, and you can have a play, generate keys, see what kind of different keys come out, how they're being encoded, how you can sign and verify signatures and stuff like that. Um, you find heaps of stuff on there. All right. Mitigating risk. As I said, if you put all your eggs in one basket and that one basket goes missing or, or somebody breaks an egg in it, then um, you're a little bit screwed. So you need to do something um, about that. Um, one thing that you can do to mitigate the risk of losing, for example, something um, this has been going on. Have you heard of Shamir, Adi Shamir? Have you, who's heard of RSA, the algorithm? RSA stands for Rivers Shamir Edelman. So those were three blokes in the US who have um, developed one of the very famous um, public key cryptography algorithms, the RSA algorithm, which can be used for encryption and cryptographic signing. Uh, very cool stuff. You, based on um, discrete logarithm problem through exponentiation. Um, and Shamir has had more than just this. Uh, so he also uh, cobbled up the Shamir secret sharing. So in a way, this is about breaking up a key into different components that you can distribute amongst people to recombine the stuff. Now what you could do is you could write it down on a piece of paper and you're ripping that into three pieces and you say, here, lawyer, you're gonna get one of them. My wife gets another one and um, whatever, my best mate, all trustworthy people, they get the other one. Sounds good. Now they have to come together. You have compartmentalized your risk in a, in a way that not a single person can just do a runner with the funds. On the other hand, you've increased your risk of loss because if somebody has their house go up in fire, Again, you have a problem. There's a way where you can go and take those keys and take those, let's look at the mnemonic uh, phrases, take certain word combinations, distribute them amongst different lists and distribute them. So you could do that in a very nifty way so that you could say, I have created, I don't know, let's say seven of these lists and any th three of them coming together could recombine it. So you have now built in some redundancy. Still, it's not very secure. You've mitigated the risk, but it's not very secure. Shamir secret sharing goes on a binary level and, and goes and breaks that into pieces. Um, it's doing that in a very good way. It can be used to recombine then the original secret uh, you can do it with the mnemonic phrases or any binary keys. And um, yeah, you can dial up or down, can say, I want to have three people or five people or two people, or let's call, not talk about people, but shares. Let's say you say three shares need to come together, but you can say this person is very trustworthy. They're getting two shares, but so they can not do anything by themselves. They need to get together with one other person who has one share. But if this person isn't there, we can still pick three other people coming together with their shares and recombine the secret. Very cool, works very well. One of the things is you have to have at least at some point the entire key come together. On the one hand, when you're distributing it, amongst the people or when you want to recombine it to get access back to it. 
So if somebody at that point of time could do a snatcher and a runner, you're still not better off. So there are other possibilities. You can go the multi-sig or multiple signature path of doing things. This is like in a bank where you have a multi-signature account. Different people need to sign on the dotted line. If somebody witnesses the right number of people and the right people have done their signing bit, it gets approved. This is what this is, only it's um, mapped to the blockchain world. So different types of wallets or addresses can handle multiple signatures. Um, the thing is they will require multiple transactions. The multiple transactions means you're driving up your, your cost and your, your effort for doing it. Um, all signers are visible. So there's an audit trail, which could be very good um, in a case because you know who has come together to do something. So you have a full audit trail there. Um, but because now you have a different type of signing for a transaction, this is not supported by everything that works on blockchain because they're very often working. There's um, a public key and the public key is representative of the address and there's got to be one private key and one signature to make that stuff happen. And they often collapse when they're facing multiple signatures. So coming to the next animal, multi-party computation. So you can have multiple parties coming together to collectively produce one signature that then can be used for, for everything directly. So that requires the multiple parties to collaborate um, to make that single signature or that single transaction. Um, they usually do these things off-chain somewhere, so by whatever, a secure messaging protocol by coming together somewhere. Each one only holds their part of that signature, that partial signature, and only when a threshold number of them come together, they can actually go and provide a final signature that is valid. Um, but nobody can do a runner because you're nowhere ever creating the compound secret that would allow one to snatch it and do a runner and, and do everything just by themselves because they want to. Um, so this is really cool, but it doesn't provide an audit trail on chain because there's just one signature and you don't know who's participated in it. But on the other hand, it's also a bonus because it means more privacy. So if you don't want to expose who was involved in this particular process. So less transparency, but higher privacy. It depends, you can balance what you want to achieve with it. Um, usually that requires some outside tooling, so some very specific um, user clients that you can use uh, and uh, some secured communications um, channels. Um, there are ways to do these uh, multi-party threshold signatures that you can again dial up and down how many signatures do I want to come together uh, compatible with the normal blockchain so that they're compatible with a SecP 256K1. Uh, it's a bit more complex to do on that um, curve, on that signature scheme, but it's possible. There's a, a BLS threshold or BLS signature scheme that is now uh, up and coming and becoming more and more popular, particularly on the uh, beacon chain on Ethereum and some other places. Um, so it's also very secure. It uses a different type of signature um, that makes this particular type of mechanism much, much simpler, the multi-party um, part. But it's not as compatible with most of the base chains. So it might be possible to do that on layer two scalability, but not on layer one. Um, so you'll find it usually there in, in layer two networks. Maybe at some point it will also percolate down into layer one. We will just have to see. Just like, uh, what do you mean in general by not being compatible with most base chains? Yeah, so if you're looking at your Bitcoin or your um, Ethereum, for example, and, and those other chains derived from that or that are made to be, you know, in the same spirit, they're all using SecP. 256K1 as their elliptic curve. BLS uses a different elliptic curve. And the way how the 
signature is being computed is very different um, because the ECDSA is leaning on how are DSA signatures done and then in the way how are they done on elliptic curves. It's mocking the same mechanism. Also, those signatures require a nonce. A nonce is a piece of information or data that never recurs. So usually some kind of a random number, or in some cases, like on a theorem, when you're doing something, they need to be always incrementing larger than the previous one. So as long as they're not repeating, that's all good. Um, and so therefore, because that is massaged into the way how the signature is being generated, and different signatures need a different nonce, and you must never reuse a nonce, the signatures are different. Whereas BLS um, has deterministic signatures. If you assign the same content, 7,000 times, you get 7,000 times the same signature. So they're using different principles. Uh, there's another uh, curve 25519 that is being used for like the, the Edwards curve 25519 with the Edwards DSA signing scheme that is also deterministic. It requires a nonce, but they have fused into the protocol that deriving their nonce by hashing the content and that number coming out of it is being used as a non. So it becomes deterministic by a different means than the BLS signatures. But different signature schemes have different ways how they're working and they're not compatible with each other. So you have to make the network understand different signature types in the core of Bitcoin Core or the Ethereum virtual machine um, in the network to make these work also for other signatures. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, so like, you can't just bolt a new scheme on top. Exactly, exactly. yes. Or well, if you do, it'll be very expensive. Yeah. So like, with Ethereum, where you've got the virtual machine and the smart contract language, just the amount of computation to do a non-standard verification of a signature that's on a different curve than the standard curve for Ethereum is going to cost like, a hundred times more than a normal signature verification from the built-in curve. Yeah. Plus, it will be a verification that is based on the code of the smart contract of what's coming out that's not native to the chain. So you can't make a native BLS transaction signature um, with that, but you could fuse that into the payload that you send to a smart contract. You'll get to smart contracts then in a future le uh, lecture. Um, where you can do stuff in the payload of that smart contract. The smart contract is like a piece of a script, a piece of code sitting on chains. It's not a legal contract. Detach yourself from legal contract. It's, it's a piece of code, a piece of logic that's living on chain and that can be executed on chain. By the way, if anybody has any questions, start waving, shout, guy, guy, I want to know something. Do whatever you like. Get my attention. I'll answer them happily. I've had a lecture that was one of the coolest lectures I've had. I think it was highly secure systems in the past here, where all of a sudden the students weren't sitting on their tables, on their chairs, but they all kind of sat squat on the carpet in front of the, the whiteboard and the data projector. That was a really cool vibe in that lecture. All right. So. Tokens, you probably have heard of some tokens like NFTs that are very hip at the moment. Who's heard of NFTs? Yeah, there are probably more that are ju you're just too shy to raise your hands. So NFTs, um, crypto kitties, whatever, monkeys, uh, cyber collectibles, and, and all kinds of other stuff. There's so much more in it. But, um, but in the end, they represent digital assets, something that can be tracked on, on chain. I'll get to, to what that can be. So, yeah, there are these kind of collectibles, JPEGs that are supposed to have a big value. But then, you know, I can download a JPEG. You're not supposed to do that. Well, but it's there if you don't have the asset. Anyway, I find these collectibles pretty silly. What they are cool for, though, is to develop the tech and do actual real things with it. So let's have a look at what kind of tokens are there and, and how we can categorize them. By the way, 
Is that okay if we overrun a little bit? Oh uh, yeah, we're here on six. Oh, All right, six. I was just thinking it was five. Okay, cool. Um, so they're the cha native chain um, assets. So these are usually the coins, your, your Bitcoin, your Litecoin, your Ether, your, um, uh, your, your Stellar Lumen or whatever on the different chains. They're the native assets that are used to make that chain work. So Ethereum or Ether is actually not, has never been intended to be a store of value, even though it has a value but it's been designed to be a utility token to drive the chain and make the chain well behaved and operate, whereas Bitcoin is a slightly different thing. Anyway, so those are the native chain assets uh, or your coins, and they are tokens. They're just native to the chain. And then you have the um, programmable tokens, like your, your different tokens that you can create using a chain like uh, Bitcoin, like Ethereum or something like that to create your own tokens. And that could be anything. That could be a loyalty program. That could be <laughs> crypto kitties or cyber zombies. They can be um, artwork that you're selling. That Those can be other, um, like there was the, uh, the big craze of ICOs. So where you have um, coin offerings as a fundraiser to a company, but they can be representative of anything. They can be loyalty points like air points or whatever. And then kind of the, that's one differentiation. Another differentiation is fungible versus non-fungible tokens. So fungible tokens are uh, those that are uh, unique. For example, if I have a car, or let's say a house, the title to the house is unique. It's that one house, not the neighbor house. It's that one house. It's very important that it's that house. Whereas um, a non-fungible token would be like a stamp or um, a money bill, a $10 bill. So if I have a $10 bill, I can have any $10 bill and I can go to Mecca's and buy myself a Big Mac. Can you get a Big Mac for 10 bucks? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, but they're, they're fungible. Yes, they have numbers. They're from the central bank's perspective, very non-fungible for tracking that they're no counterfeit bills, but in the value, in the day-to-day -day usage asset value, they're very fungible. You can just use any $10 bill. So if you're looking at Bitcoin, every Bitcoin basically is the same. Every Ether is the same, at least in theory. It doesn't matter which one you have. But for other things, it, it matters. Which one do you have? Do I have this piece of artwork or that piece of artwork? Okay, we can go expand our dimensions on how we are looking at um, how we can see what, what types of tokens um, we can have. So it's about transferability. Is it transferable or not? For example, votes. There could be votes somewhere that, no, it's got to be you, Jeff. Nobody else but Jeff can vote with that token. Or it could be a transferable one. Ah, oh, you know, um, I'm going to be absent from the AGM of my free diving club, I'll transfer my vote to, to Paul because Paul's going to be there and he's going to represent my, my choices there because I trust him. So you can have this um, then divisibility. For example, cash. Cash can be divided further, further, further. Can you divide it further than a cent? Yeah. On a um, accounting bit, you can certainly do so. Maybe, but there, there might be certain rules in it, but that can be something I can't divide, let's say, a token that represents my house, but I can divide other tokens. Singleton, so I might have a very specific piece of art, like the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. It's one, and there's only one of that kind, so I can't go and make another one. But for other things, I might have multiple of them. Um, mintable burnable. So you might have something like an inventory item in your company. You've just produced, I don't know, pairs of sneakers and you're representing each one with, a, with an NFT, with a token. So you can make more as you have more stock in your, uh, on your shelves. And then as you sell them, you burn them again. So 
you can increase and decrease the volume. This is, by the way, something that's very often used. Have you heard of IBC, Inter-Blockchain Connectivity? So, yep, exactly, Cosmos, Polkadot, and, and whatever mechanisms, um, also centralized mechanisms. So there's a lot of this stuff where we have to detach ourselves from the idea there will be one blockchain to rule them all. It's not the Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Chains. There are different chains that serve different purposes with different properties, but often you need to orchestrate things that are taking advantage of different things that might be living on different networks. So you need to have somehow sort of transition. And often you can take a, a token that now needs to move from one chain to another one so that something can happen on the other chain. What very often happens is that token goes, slams into the uh, custom security officer border guard. They hold it, freeze it. And there's another one on the other side. They're minting a new token on that other network that now moves further. And that token might be burned here and minted there. And when it comes back, slams into that guard, it's being burned. A new one is created there so that you have a virtual flow of tokens between networks. That's usually how they work. They're, they're minting and burning tokens or they're locking them up, holding them in a scroll. So they're different mechanisms of doing so. But Minting and burning is something that's very often happening. You can have a fixed or variable quantity, uh, like uh, maybe shares, currency, stock inventory, where you might have different, in some shares you might have, no, we're saying this company has a thousand shares and we define this can't change. So each share goes up, but uh, in a fundraiser, you just have to find other ways to have somebody sell some shares to somebody, or you can create more shares as you're raising more funds. But that's a differentiation, how you're creating them. You can have state chains or role changes. So for example, um, also in shares, you might have shares to a company that don't give you the rights to vote, and others might have the right to vote. Or you can have a state of a token so you might have a token for something that you're putting up for as collateral for security for getting a loan issued on it. So you're not losing that thing unless you're defaulting on the loan. So as soon as you pay the money back, you get the token back, but you might be still able to use it. It might not change owner anymore once you've put it as collateral in some way, but you might be still using it, for example, to in the governance process and the voting for some other thing. So they have states that could change depending on what's happening with those tokens. Uh, an interesting one is I used to work in, uh, in trade tech. So where you have international trade, you're having an export, let's say from New Zealand, you're sending whatever New Zealand kiwi fruit over to Taiwan. Now when you're exporting the kiwi fruit, it takes, I don't know how many weeks for the kiwi fruit to be on the ship to go to the other side. During that period, you're getting your money once the destination uh, party has received the kiwi fruit. But you lost the value from your own warehouse once they got on into the container on the ship. What do you do in the meantime? Banks or other people know you're going to get your money back. So they can use potentially that bill of lading, which is a little bit like a title to to the goods, you could use that bill of lading as a collateral to get a loan on it. So there might be some people saying, you know, it's very likely that the goods are going to get to the other end. And that, let's say it takes three weeks. So for the three weeks, I'm going to give you a loan on it. And by the time it reaches there, you give me the money back and you get your title back and, and the, uh, the recipient can claim their goods and the, at the destination port. I'm gonna charge you some interest for it but it's a, it's a very low risk loan. So at that point of time, that bill of lading, if you tokenize that into an NFT, could be used for that, but you might, once it's locked in as, a, um, as collateral for a loan, might not be changing owners anymore. So there are all kinds of things that can happen. Expiry, you might have a rented digital artifact. So I don't know, you, you are getting on loan uh, an ebook from your local library and you're allowed to have it for 21 days for three weeks. So the token that is representing your, your rental period, your loan period, 
might tick down and expire at some point of time. Um, so at that point of time, it becomes invalid for, for claiming that, that ebook maybe. So you could have things like that. Not just uh, ebook, right? Could be all kinds of things. Could be all kinds of things that can expire. Um, so it can be all very confusing. And uh, if you know a little bit about programming and computer science, you can do a lot of things with code. So there's some need to standardize some things so to prevent things from not being able to work anymore. So Don Tapscott, he is a pretty famous guy in the blockchain uh, space. He has created this Blockchain Research Institute with his son together. And he's quite influential, particularly in the US. And he has created this report, Token Economy. And um, so there's some quotes that I thought were quite well worth putting on here. So some folks have disparate and seemingly contradictory names for different types of tokens. For example, work token, use token, investment token, asset token, payment token, etc. Others use the word token when they really mean contract. Because in the end, you're going to get to that in a future lecture when you're talking about Ethereum much more. You have um, what some people call a uh, platform blockchain. So one that doesn't just handle value, like in Bitcoin, which is about the coins and the move of the coins, the value and holding and transfer of it, but additional data and logic with it. And that is guided by those smart contracts. And those contracts are pieces of code. So you can do all kinds of jazz with it. Um, and tokens are usually implemented in that code, in that so-called uh, smart contract. And uh, so people often, especially people who don't know exactly the terminology, get it wrong. And, and <laughs> but, you know, that's what I mean. But that's not what you said but people receive it in a particular way. So it's very important to distinguish what is a token and what is the contract, what is the code behind it. And there was another one in this uh, document. So it's tempting to put contract logic within your token. It would be like saying, I'm going to create a token for a property title and I'm going to put the information and the logic for how it should be paid in the token itself. That's essentially making your token non-reusable because it has contract logic embedded within it that may not apply to the next sale of the title. Just as we don't write our mortgages on the actual money we're paying them with, because we need to reuse the money, we don't want, want that. Um, so you need to have some kind of a standard and, and make it behave in a particular way so that you can use it. For example, the, the title of a house is for declaring I have ownership if I sell my house to Paul or to Jeff, sorry, those are the only names I know in this room here. <laughs> I usually have been picking out some of my students and one was the evil one and one was the good one and then I was doing something with another one and the evil one wanted to invade. I've had a particular guy who was a, well, drifting off in, in anecdote, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it was fun. He was Evil Wayne and always people, and he's sometimes sending me messages on LinkedIn. Hey, Evil Wayne here. So <laughs> kind of still using that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so if, if that title of that house now passes on to somebody else, they need to be able to do the same thing. And if you are using that title of the house, maybe it's been paid off or something, as collateral, as a security for getting another loan, it needs to be compatible with that... Uh, other smart contract, that other construct where a loan is being issued on that. So it has to work in all those different ways. So you must resist the urge to do whatever you can with it. That's what we have protocols for, like standardized ways of handling things. So let's have a look at those standards. Well, actually, they're not standards. They're interfaces. So if, who's been doing some programming, ever, any kind of programming? There must be more than zero people in here. Who's been programming? Who's a computer scientist? It can't be true. Jeff has sent me kind of a summary of people, and there were quite a few people, computer scientists. Uh, That's true. I, re I revealed 
build some of the information from day one, then you probably uh, Yeah, in aggregates only, so it's it's non-personalized. Come on, show some hands. Who's written programs before? Cool. So if you're programming or doing it in a proper way, like that's what software engineering is, where you're kind of making it a skill that is maintainable over time. You're not just coding things out, hard coding everything, but when you want things to interoperate between different uh, places and things, you create an interface. And then you're using that interface that is like your, your contract between the two sides. This is how the thing is behaving. The implementation of that interface can look different and can be, let's say, working once with this database, with that database, with no database at all, or whatever. As long as they're all speaking the same language that's defined in the interface, it works. And this is what these standards are. So they're standards of interfaces, not standards of implementations. Exactly. Application programming interface, APIs, exactly. Perfect, thank you. Token of my appreciation. Non-fungible. Um, so, there is the ERC-20, that's probably one of the most well-known, long-standing um, standards. So that's for the fungible tokens that has been used a lot for creating those ICOs where people were selling these utility tokens because they don't, didn't want to, I think I've got something on a slide somewhere else, didn't want to create securities which would be government regulated. So they've created those utility tokens, so they hoped they were not just uh, superficial enough, uh, a utility, like a stamp that you could use to actually send letters around and you could trade with them and stuff like that. Um, but there are also all kinds of other um, NFTs that really were utility, like loyalty points or whatever, that didn't give you any ownership in anything. Um, then for the NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, that is uh, ESC721, that is the one that has gained the biggest kind of uh, popularity. Um, and then there are some, two others. They have tried to tweak things and make them a little bit more well-behaved, uh, a little bit enhanced in their usage value. So the ESC777, it's not a, a Boeing airplane, um, enhanced the efficiency of ESC20s through so-called hooks. So you can have third-party token um, transfers. You can transfer on behalf of. So a third party that could be a person, that could be a contract, could be transferring your tokens you've given them to somebody else. Like, you know, with stamps paying for something that you're doing in an automated way. Um, and that can happen in only one transaction rather than having two, where I'm putting them into the uh, into the ownership of that contract that then goes and transfers them elsewhere that can be fused into one. And that is backwards compatible with ERC-20. And then there's the ERC-1155. ERC, by the way, it's like BIP, only it's different. Ethereum... Well, it does start as an EIP, so as a proposal. Yes. And then when it becomes an ERC, it's a release candidate for... Yeah, okay. So it's, this is for Ethereum kind of the equivalent of BIP, but um, so these standards all have numbers. Have you heard of RFCs on the internet? The um, Internet Engineering Task Force has created all these RFCs, request for comments, and they have a number. So RFC, for example, 8601 is one for writing down an ISO conformant uh, timestamp where you have year dash month dash year T and then the time and, and whatever with time zone and stuff. So all these things have been somewhere specified, def defined. Who's heard of JSON? JavaScript object notation. Probably much more. You just, it's, I know it's late. So you're getting weak and your wings don't want to flap as much anymore. Um, so JSON, the standard, has been also defined by RFCs and, and things like that. So it's, this is in a, in a similar way there, those standards that have been somewhere specced up and defined. So ESC 1155 uh, brings together or enhances aspects of fungibility independent and gas efficient token contracts. So you can have multiple token type characteristics within one token. And also it enhances uh, the efficiency for batch transfers um, 
of uh, many tokens. So if you have one token type and you want to, oh, you get seven of them, you get 54, you get 42 and whatever, I can do that in one transaction rather than having to fire off three transactions, which makes the transaction fees come down way lower and it occupies less block space and creates less congestion on the network. One thing around the interfaces is all four that guys mentioned there all has have a function transfer, right? So yeah. they're kind of building up from each other as kind of either a superset or a unique variation. And that's meant that a wallet that only actually understands transferring from an ARC20 can support all those other assets as long as it supports transfer, but it might not have the benefits of the improved functionality. Sorry. Can you actually hear <laughs> the microphone? I know you in the room can hear, but the recording might not catch Paul there. And I'm just refrained from parroting everything. I just hope the recording catches enough of it. Um, all right, so there's some standards. If you do deal with tokens on a coding basis, make sure you bloody well stick to those standards of the interfaces. You can have all kinds of tweaks behind the scenes, but things must be ensured that they're very secure. And that is another thing because cloud software, you can replace an implementation of an API on a server, let's say on AWS in a container or something like that, very easily. But it's out there on the blockchain. Everybody who's a participant on the blockchain can read that contract, can reverse engineer the code, see if there are maybe some weaknesses in there, can exploit them. So. Usually those contracts, those codes are very simple, trying to be very simple. And if they're very simple, they can be much more easily secured. I have uh, shown a little bit their BIPs, their ERCs. They're on different chains. They work very differently. So Bitcoin is the first animal in the blockchain space that actually had a really working principle where everything came together, the cryptography, the distributed algorithms or the consensus finding, and the, the game theory, the incentive system, in a way tweaked, that was just there to store value and transfer value. And then on the other hand, later Ethereum coming onto the uh, playground, being the hip new kid there that now said, we don't just have value transfer, but we offer you to put um, data and logic onto chain that can operate. So it's a platform blockchain. They have very different properties, but um, you, so the things work differently on different types of blockchains and you, a chain like Bitcoin was never really made to do tokens besides the native chain token, the native asset, Bitcoin but you can do them. So people have found ways to do these kinds of things. So on, for example, the platform blockchains like Ethereum, you can have smart contracts or codes. Actually, I'm not the biggest fan of a system called Hyperledger Fabric. Um, it's, it's one of those open source things that's now under the uh, Linux Foundation has come out of um, labs from IBM. So it's kind of for an enterprise blockchain. They've been advertising a lot with enterprise to make things show, look really, look, this is the awesome, this is the enterprise stuff, not the open source stuff. But in the blockchain world, enterprise is actually the lesser one, whereas the public unpermissioned blockchains have much higher properties the other way, but it sounds, anyway. Um, Hyperledger Fabric, you can deploy your own network. It's a so-called permission network, so not everybody can participate. But what I want to get to on Fabric, they call, the smart contracts, not smart contracts, they call them chain code. And I really love that term, chain code. It, it is actually, I think it captures in the best way what it does. It's a little piece of code that you throw out and that's stored on chain. And once it's there, you can address it and you can trigger it to be executed to perform certain functions. Whereas smart contracts, the term implies contractual things, all of a sudden you're surrounded by lawyers and you can't get anywhere because lawyers want to see everything through the legal angle. But hey, go away pestering me. I want to solve a technical problem here. I'm, I don't want to 
Yeah, but it's a smart contract. Whatever contracts are involved, we need to get involved too. So get away. You know, they're, they're like the flies around the, the dung that the cows poop out. Um, so I really love the term chain code, even though I'm not the biggest fan. I don't hate it, but I'm not the biggest fan of Hyperledger Fabric. But so whenever you hear smart contract, think in, in the back of your head, got nothing to do with legalese. Legalese, yes, you can say that's kind of uh, rules that are put into words so that lawyers and maybe some other people understand as well. But um, in the end, this is about logic. This is about code that lives on chain. So chain code is probably the better term. So whenever I say smart contract now, because that's on where you hear it, think in the back of your head, chain code, chain code, chain code. Anyway, so um, platform blockchains like Ethereum can have those chain codes, <laughs> those smart contracts living on them. That is code that's stored on chain. So code, if you compile a piece of source code, Java or whatever, it becomes bytecode. That binary can go somewhere. It's the same thing on Ethereum. You have Solidity or Viper or whatever other code that is being compiled into a bytecode that then is being put via a transaction onto chain. And from there, the Ethereum virtual machine, an analogy to the Java virtual machine, can execute that code on any node of the blockchain. And it's actually being executed on every node of the bloody network. So that's why they need to be lightweight. They need to be easy because otherwise you're running that on thousands and thousands of nodes worldwide. And if that bogs down the computers, they want money for it. Um, Anyway, so there you have those things. Systems, networks like Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever, they don't have that. Or Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. They have um, a different model. That's the UTXO model. I'll get to what that is um, in a moment. Um, so they're just dealing with transferring coins and value from here to there and making sure that the balances are kept, that money can't be spent multiple times. So people have found some kind of hacks to differentiate between different coins um, or fractions of coins um, by, by putting some kind of markers or some bit of additional information into the, um, the UTXO, the unspent transaction output. And um, others are using different ordering schemes uh, for, for things where you can, for example, uniquely identify every Satoshi. You know what a Satoshi is? Yeah. Raise your hand if you don't know what a Satoshi is. Cool. Um, a Satoshi is it's like a cent. It's the smallest unit um, in Bitcoin. Uh, so one Bitcoin has two to the 18th uh, Satoshi. Yeah, a hundred millionths of a Bitcoin. It's like a cent, only way, way, way smaller. So Satoshi Nakamoto is the proverbial author of the Bitcoin paper when it has been published. So they've used the term Satoshi for the smallest unit of um, a Bitcoin. So you're representing also when you're making transfer, everything's represented in Satoshis. It's like when you're making a money transfer from bank to bank. Um, you know, you could express everything in cents, so you don't have a decimal anymore. And that's kind of how they work. Token usage. So what can you do with them besides having silly collectibles? Some people have been saying, you know, maybe we need to make NFTs because they're the hip thing at the moment. And uh, then everybody will buy our stuff. Sorry. Yeah, if, at the moment, you know, they're, they're luxury items. Luxury items don't do well in a recession. So they're the first ones to go down. And especially, they don't really have much of a utility. So, but then those are the silly NFTs. So, um, so now looking at things that are a little bit more tangible, I've been trying to hint at that. So a token can be used as a security for a financeable loan contract, for example. So um, actually, those could live on a different network. 
So you might have to deal with one of those network bridges being Cosmos, Polkadot, or centralized bridges where they get uh, locked up or burnt and, and reminted on the other side and when they come back doing something else again so that they can um, happen because you might have a very high frequency trading market on one network and the other one's just dealing with resilience or something like that. Um, they can be expressing uh, proof of ownership uh, like a title for a house or something like that. And then this is what I've been mentioning. There could be security. So securities are tokens that are possibly subject to government regulation, like shares in a company. If you own shares in zero, that's a security. There's a lot of red tape around that I know because I used to be CTO in a company that has gone public. It was a massive crap load of work to get listed on a stock exchange and you have to do all kinds of stuff and bend over backwards and when I wanted to sell shares I needed to first ask whether I may sell shares and every sell share within five days I had a report as a CTO to the stock exchange that I have just traded so many shares and whatnot and there's all that jazz around securities and, and the legalese for the company for the people dealing with them and stuff like that around it so securities are a particular kind of tokens. But there could be also not securities like utilities, like stamps or um, airpoint uh, for, for Air New Zealand or something like that, the airpoint dollars. So there, a lot of things can be done with them. Um, so Jason Panix, this is also from the um, Don Tapscott paper. Um, we, need to t uh, we need token standards so that businesses can begin integrating decentralized networks adjacent to pre-existing enterprise systems. This standardization will ensure the future of trust across globalized economy. Um, making the spelling more New Zealand or more, more British English is my change, but I haven't changed otherwise anything on that. Um, so there's the thing, we need to have that, that standardization and we need to, and we can actually use all those tokens that are not necessarily just uh, JPEGs of monkeys or something like that and do all kinds of things with them if we have them standardized, if we are creating the context, the ecosystem where they can um, deal with them. I've recently listened on, there's a podcast called the Epicenter podcast. Um, there was an episode with a company um, in Europe. I think one guy is here. Irish, one guy's, I think, Canadian or whatever. But um, companies called Niftify. So they have these uh, NFT token marketplaces and they were talking about what can you do actually. So getting, for example, small scale loans on them and, and what kind of risk mitigations are there, what the ins and outs of the different token types are, uh, were. And that kind of sets up the platform, the stage that is at the moment being created with the silly collectibles in a way, or NFTs for Nike sneakers or, or things like that, that can be later transferred to higher value business items when the, once the system has evolved and matured and, and being secured so that you can then also use title to your um, property, um, shares of your um, company expressed as NFTs. Um, my bill of lading for my export of kiwi fruit from New Zealand to Taiwan, and I can use these and, and use them for different types of business purposes. And uh, one thing, when people ask me about what is blockchain, there's so many answers to that. But one of the things that is one of my favorite answers to them is it's a trust engine. In some way, because you have everybody policing everybody else, making sure that nobody does anything bad, like when the, with the example of North Korea participating in it, they can't destroy it or, or um, subvert it. They can only make it better because now more people are in it. So. Everybody is policing everybody else. That's why the North Koreans can't do anything bad on blockchain. They might be doing something bad in terms of laundering their money or getting finances, but in terms of not disturbing the network. So that's why I'm thinking the one of the core values of blockchain technology, it's a trust engine without having to need 
a trusted third party, like a government, like a central bank, like um, some kind of an intermediator. So it's a decentralized system that creates that trust for you so that you don't need uh, another third party and therefore you're completely disintermediated. So you can deal directly peer to peer. I can do stuff with Paul and with Jeff and any of you without having to go through any other trusted disintermediator. You might want to clip the ticket or more than them. Um, so just thinking about that with a kind of globalized economy, this is a thing blockchain technology is an, an enabler for these kinds of things. Um, difference, tokens and money. So stable coins are often ERC20 tokens like um, USDC, like the um, Circle stable coin or the, uh, the Maker DAI um, stable coin, which is uh, a fully decentralized stable coin. Um, so they can kind of act as money. But if you want to make a token be and feel like money, there's some properties. If you're thinking back about the list of categorization properties, we can pick a few. So it needs to be delegable. Delegable? It's a, it's a weird word. So it's about delegating things. Um, then uh, it needs to be transferable, uh, that I can actually pay it and, and hold it. Uh, so I need to be holdable. It needs to be holdable. I can, it can retain value. It doesn't expire. I think in China they're doing that with those, uh, with the digital currencies there where they do these kind of airdrops to incentive people spending money. But if you haven't spent it until then or in the right appropriate ways, the money kind of evaporates. Um, Anyway, so it needs to be holdable, it needs to be compliant, burnable, and mintable. So central banks need to, or whoever is the custodian of it, needs to be able to make more or reduce the volume. So if you have these things, um, you're kind of starting to behave like money. Are there more behaviors that are missing from the list? Probably, possibly, depending to what degree you want to recreate money as it is and depends also on whether you're talking about cash or whether any kind of digital money or something like that where the holdability might be only within bounds like a Prezi card that expires or something like that. But um, so there are a lot of anal analogies and you can create digital tokens that will actually have a utility value similar to money. So that goes to the point, um, there are some coins that are wrapped. So for example, as I said, um, Ether on Ethereum and Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network are the native tokens. So they don't adhere to an ERC-20 standard, but often you need an ERC-20 standard to do something. So if you want to use a Bitcoin as a collateral for a loan or something like that, well, sorry, mate, can't be done. Hold a second, right there. We can wrap it. So people have been taken, um, taking bitcoins or ether and, and wrap them, create a um, kind of a proxy token that wraps a particular bitcoin, a particular ether, and then makes it available um, as an ERC20 token. And that can happen with all kinds of networks. And then, like Paul said, those additional properties can be superimposed on those, um, maybe on other networks like bitcoin basically virtually making its way onto the Ethereum network. So it gets really interesting when you're looking at these types of um, approaches. So I've already mentioned that there are different ways on how tokens have to be created due to the different properties of the different um, chains or the different networks. Um, and I'm going to have a little bit of a drill down to give you a little bit of understanding on um, where, not going into everything, but just particularly focusing on Bitcoin and Bitcoin-like coins on the one hand and uh, Ethereum-like coins on the other hand, where those account models are different. So these account models are responsible for setting the parameters on how coins are being used and transferred and, and mapped and designed so on the different networks. So if we have a look 
There's the UTXO model. UTXO is an acronym for unspent transaction output. So if you're making a transaction on Bitcoin, I'm actually saying, this is all the Bitcoin I'm holding. Let's say I want to send something to Paul. Then I'm going to, to take what I'm going to send to Paul, create um, Paul in that transaction as a um, recipient. All the rest, almost all the rest, I'm transferring to myself. And then there can be a little bit of additional data being wrapped up in the transaction. Just see it in some way like, uh, you know, when you do a bank transfer from one person to another where you can put a reference number or some things in there. And then whatever I'm not spending is basically a transaction fee that the miner who mines the block is getting then as a, um, as a reward in addition to the mining reward, the, the block reward that he's getting through the network. So they're getting, you've probably talked about this on the one hand, uh, the mining reward, which at the moment sits at 6.25 uh, Bitcoin per block mined, started out with 50. And on the other hand, he gets the sum of all the slivers of transaction fees. And if there's a lot of competition for getting into that block, people need to set more and more and more and more aside to make that happen. So you need to kind of revolve everything to yourself again and parts go elsewhere. Um, anyway, there's this unspent transaction output. These things are all going to find their way into the block on blockchain. And this UTXO, this is a bit of data that people have found a way to actually use as leverage to do other things with it. Um, so on the one hand, if you want to know how much Bitcoin, Litecoin, Feathercoin, whatever Bitcoin cash you have, you actually need to go take the blockchain, start from the uh, Genesis block, go all the way to the present, and then you know how much you have. Cumbersome but uh, very simple because you only need to deal with what am I transacting and stuff. If I want to find out what I have, well, mate, here's the data, you find out. Um, so that's how those original first um, blockchains are working. But also this makes different other protocols like layer two, um, like Lightning Network and uh, side chains and whatever, very simple because they don't have any particular thing that's in the model I'm going to talk about next uh, uh, in there that make it more difficult to do because in the end, hey, mate, all the data is there. Go through, do your homework, and you'll find out and you'll know. Now, networks like Ethereum, they're featuring the so-called account model. So they have a much quicker balance verification because they're holding the state of every wallet address of every account uh, in a very compact form available within the block. So um, verification and knowledge of state and they can contain variables and, and code and whatever is all encapsulated in one piece in one place very easy. But that means whenever there's a state change, they need to take the entire wallet's account's content <laughs> plonk that into the next block again so that there's a new fresh summary so you don't have to go and grind yourself to, through the entire chain to find out what the state actually is, which makes coding against it from within smart contracts much easier, working with it much easier. But yes, it is much more burdensome in terms of um, size on the um, Ethereum network. The blocks become fuller through that you have more state that you're replicating that has been found in the past already, but you can't be bothered going through, look through all these things. Um, so it's a very different model, but in the end, they're both coming out with valid approaches to make a blockchain that works. Does it make sense? So the account model is more like what a bank is holding for you, where they have in a database sitting what you have in your different sub accounts. And when you have logged in, they can, cough all these things up, they're keeping track of the state. Whereas in the uh, Bitcoin-like world, 
Here's the ledger. You have an entire room full of shelves and of every shelf you've got many, many folders and every fo folders you have on one sheet every block. And if you want to know, that's the beginning on the far left end corner or the bottom left of the shelf. And then you go through all the paperwork and you'll find out. Um, which one is better? Well, it depends. If you want to bolt on other things, make them extensible, the UTXO model is more flexible and is more, more easy to do things without breaking with change because now everybody can make their transactions and if you take them all together, you know about the state. You don't need to go and then, oh, I want to make a change here, but now I need to ask them to persist that, but then there's no model for them to talk with each other in that same way as easily. So it becomes much, uh, if easier much uh, or much more difficult in the account model and much easier to do these types of extensions in the uh, UTXO model. If you're dealing with privacy dem um, demands, the non-account based model or the UTXO model is uh, the much more privacy preserving system. Do you have an idea why? This is the thought experiment. I don't know who, whether people can still think at this time of day. Yeah, but that account could be encrypted or something as well. Why is it still more privacy preserving? Let's say if you're using WhatsApp, if you're using WeChat or whatever, the protocol may be encrypted between the two sides, but why are companies like Facebook or whatever or Meta interested in it? because they can observe the two endpoints communicating, all that metadata, the connection network. I usually say there's no sarcasm in metadata. Sure, I didn't rob the bank. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, sarcasm. If you interpret that linguistically, it's like, uh, of course, guy didn't rob the bank. But if I say it that way, obviously, I probably was the one who robbed the bank. If uh, so, their sarcasm makes it hard, but metadata you can take at, at, at face value every time. So, when there is a communication from me to you, the network will see that I've sent something to you. So, we are leaking with every transaction something, some information about the communication, even though we might not know exactly the value and whatever. But if I'm transferring money to you on a repeated basis, there's something that the network can see, which is a leak uh, in, in, in uh, privacy and in, in information. So if we have a UTXO model, if that transaction and everything within it is encrypted and it goes on the UTXO on the network, it just ends in a block. And if you want to find out whether you have received a coin and you need to rake through things and use your crypto key and see whether there are any transactions that you can decrypt and nobody else can, then you have knowledge of it, but an outside observer doesn't know about these things. So when you're looking at um, privacy preserving coins like Monero or Zcash, or there's also some things that are starting to come on other networks like uh, Mimblewimble and, um, and Grin, and um, there are zero knowledge um, Ethereum virtual machines coming into the, so you're thinking, isn't that enough? Don't I have the privacy? Well. You can use a zero knowledge Ethereum virtual machine on Ethereum, possibly, but that only encapsulates the transaction or the account. But from an outside observer, they can still see lots of patterns that can be very valuable to an outside observer. So in terms of privacy, a UTXO model is much better than that. If you're thinking about cash, why do people pay with cash? On the one hand, because it's easy on a flea market or between mates, you know, can you pay the beer for me? And here's the 10 bucks from last week back. Just had that yesterday after training, mate of mine forgot his wallet, so I paid for his pint and he's gonna pay me back next week. I don't think he's, or oh, he's gonna pay more for my pint, but anyway. Um, but for these things, you, you're often using cash. Also, that's why the, the people sitting at the street corner, hey, yeah. buy some? They take cash. They don't take FPOS because it's, it's anonymous because people can't see the transactions on the outside. 
So, and, and with privacy going to gain much, much more value and Bitcoin, where people are saying, oh, you know, all those crims are using Bitcoin. No, they're not. Well, the dumb ones are, but it's so easily monitorable by police and inland revenue and whatever. So it's not actually good for money laundering because it's way too transparent. One of the analogies I've heard, I really like that Bitcoin is like that massive Excel spreadsheet in the sky. If you want to make a transaction, you write it on a postcard, put it on a helium filled balloon, goes up and finds its way into the spreadsheet. And every bloody person can go and buy themselves a telescope and see, ah, where did guy get his money from? What did he spend it on? And then there's stuff like real-time pricing when you're going to websites, let's say Amazon, you're wanting to buy a book. If they have found out ways to find out what wallet address is yours on Bitcoin and you keep paying with Bitcoin, they see you've got pretty significant amount of money coming in on a regular basis. So this person can afford a lot more than you know they're, they're willing to reveal. So we can give them a little bit of a higher price than somebody coming in. And they're doing that already. People coming in on Macs, on iOS devices, sometimes pay a little bit more than people coming in on Android devices. And that is the next step. When So privacy, anonymity, and all these things will in the future become be raised to a little bit higher level. So I'm drifting away from the actual lecture but uh, or content, but I'm just thinking sometimes it's stumbling upon something, thought experiment, drawing off at a tangent. So anyway, I think that was me. It was. So will that be better for money laundering? For money laundering? Um, if you want to do money laundering, you probably want to be using something like Monero, which is a very, very well privacy preserving coin. The biggest problem with it is liquidity and being able to convert Monero to cash and cash to Monero in easy form because there's not much liquidity. But from a coin, Monero and the likes of that are really, really good. Monero is actually really nifty. They're putting all kinds of different privacy preserving things into that one network, into that one coin. Uh, so they have multiple layers of defense, like pure, true defense in depth in their protocol. And, but they can also say, let's say I'm a charity and I'm taking donations in Monero and I can have people donate to my address and I'm going to give an address that contains actually two keys, like a special public key. I can give that to Inland Revenue and they can monitor because that is a combination of the public key and a particular private viewing key with that private viewing key, they can see all the transactions, but they can't trigger any transactions because they only have part one part of the, uh, of the two private keys. So you can use these things for making very transparent things where you want to, but on the other hand, protect all the people who want to maybe anonymously donate money or something like that. But you can re reveal stuff to others. So there are lots of good things in this research, but it's being a little bit sidelined and pushed away because on the one hand, no, we don't know. It doesn't quite work with the traditional financial system so much and whatever, but yeah. So if you want to do money laundering, go use some of the privacy coins. Or I think the best way to do money laundering is still to buy and sell real estate. So completely off chain. US dollar, that's, that's how you money. Yeah, I think, uh, the largest real estate turnover in, in the greater London area is money laundering from like Russians and whatever who have somehow funds that I've heard somewhere. So don't hold me to it, but I think, for, yeah. For Guy? All right, folks, I know we're a bit over time. Let's uh, thank Guy for coming on in and giving us <laughs> the time we want to thank you so much. Tim and Paul are up to. Uh, thank you very much. You made my job very easy today. <laughs> Cheers, and thanks for augmenting everything, uh, Paul. And it's been good to come back to AUT, one of my stomping grounds. I've uh, spent a good time here at AUT, so have very fond memories of it. And so thanks for still being a good crowd here. <laughs>